Hi, everybody, and welcome to Talk Gnosis. I'm Father Tony Sylvia, and with me, as always, is Reverend Mr. Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. And to talk about Marcion of Sinate, we have returning guest, Dr. Glenn Farron of the University of Alberta. Welcome back, Dr. Farron. Thank you for having me back. It's, uh, it's our pleasure. So um, this uh, figure of Marcion uh, is someone who comes up in conversation in a lot of gnostic -y discussions, but um, I found a, a lot of information, or there just isn't really as much information about him as there are some of his uh, other um, his other folks in the <laughs> who found uh, Gnostic communities. Um, so can you tell us who was Marcion and, uh, and what was he all about? Sure. Uh, well, Marcion's one of those weird figures in that um, we have very little information uh, about him, or at least information that uh, clearly isn't uh, overblown uh, polemic. Mm. Uh, you know, his none of his writings have survived. Uh, very, there's no sort of firsthand uh, accounts by him or or anybody really close to him who describes what he was all about. So we, we tend to get all of our information from his enemies, uh, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Irenaeus, uh, folks like that. So um, his what he is is very, um, I would say, very biased. Uh, that being said, there, there does seem to be a relatively uh, consistent picture of him, or at least how he was represented. Uh, he seems to have been a business owner, uh, perhaps a ship owner, uh, so somehow involved with, with money. Uh, he, he seemed to have been a well-off individual. Uh, he was from Pontus or Sinope, de you know, depending on which source uh, you speak of. Uh, at some point, he had converted to Christianity, uh, some version of, uh, I guess, Paulinism. Uh, the Apostle Paul seems to have been his, uh, his sort of main influence. Uh, according to the narrative, he traveled to Rome, uh, he donated a large chunk of money, again, according to the myth, uh, to the church. Uh, he wished to reconfigure it along his lines, uh, was promptly uh, kicked out uh, for his terrible, terrible heresy. And then uh, he started his own series of churches that seemed to have been very popular uh, or very successful, I guess, uh, for a number of centuries uh, after um, after the uh, second century. Uh, he, I think the last sort of clear reference to Marcionism was, I want to say, the late 400s. Um, I could be wrong. I was going to say, don't quote me on that, but <laughs> of course, that's not going to happen. But uh, uh, yeah, he, he had seemed to have promoted this uh, really successful competitor to other Christianities, to the point where a lot of his rivals seem to have been quite terrified of what he represented. So uh, yeah, that seems to be who we have as Marcion uh, uh, Sinope. Can you give us kind of a, a broad outline of his thought and his brand of Christianity? Like why was his brand and his form so different? Or if he was kicked out, and maybe that's a story, you know, why did they yeah. kick him out? Sure. Um, well, it seems that Marcion, uh, the first thing that sticks out is that he believed in, or at least, and again, I keep saying uh, he believed, but we really don't know what he believed or what he did his uh again it's clearly all the representations but uh, we'll edit in many to... asterisks and uh scare quotes <laughs> Every, around, uh, everything yeah. yeah i mean i always say trying to figure out the historic marcian is like the historical jesus it's uh <laughs> there's a lot of biases built in there so i'll again we'll put the the scare quotes in but uh it appears that uh marcian or marcianism uh believed in two gods you had the just creator god that is represented in the hebrew bible uh, and also you have an alien god of love. Now, not alien like uh, in the movies or what have you, but a god who has, had not made an appearance that was unlike anything else and whose sole uh, attribute was, was love. So that is where Jesus came from, to free us from the, 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 the legal, just, uh, somewhat cruel tyrant god of the Hebrew Bible. And I don't think he saw the, the god, or at least the god isn't, presented as the, the creator as as an evil demiurge or a corrupt demonic figure it is a just figure that mediates justice like a lot of gods uh, you know the hebrew bible for marcion was literal or at least it appears that he read it in a literal fashion uh, and he could not make that jive with what paul said about jesus so it must have been two gods 
that was sort of his uh, rationality. And, and for him, Christianity was a new thing. It was a novel invention. Uh, it was revealed when Jesus showed up and started preaching uh, in the synagogue as an adult. Uh, it was unanticipated and, and new. So uh, that is where he really deviated. A lot of his contemporaries wanted to uh, hitch their version of what was Christian onto the Jewish wagon. Uh, say, we are a continuation of this ancient prestigious tradition where it appears Marcion's like nope brand new new thing and uh, that was a real problem people really had it seemed to have an issue with that so yeah. so was was Marcion anti-Jewish uh, that's a really good uh, question that always uh, tends to come up uh, I, I think well again um, the the one the sort of the short answer I think is no um, in fact, I, I believe it's Tertullian who essentially accuses him of being a Judaizer, uh, oh. which I find really interesting. He says, you know, uh, something like uh, the uh, viper takes the poison from the asp, uh, Marcion from the Jew. Uh, so, the, I mean, in, in the, which, again, you know, Tertullian being the sensitive soul that he was, uh, I'm sure he didn't mean anything negative by that. But <laughs> um, no, he seems to have, at least from my reading or how he's been represented, uh, he wanted to avoid uh, any sort of appropriation or dealing with Judaism uh, or whatever that happens to represent. I mean, the uh, uh, he didn't think it was correct, uh, clearly. He thought their practices were um, beholden to this creator God, but it was an accurate account of history. Uh, so the Hebrew narrative was very much about what really happened, uh, except that Jesus had nothing to do with it. Um, so again, I don't think he was trying to um, supplant it. There was none of that um, supersession that you get with uh, somebody like uh, Justin Martyr, who wants to overrun Judaism or 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 cast it in a whole new light, uh, or basically dismiss it. Uh, it. It appears for Marcion, he he saw it as a, um, a you know, not a valid, that's not quite the right term, but uh, a not inaccurate rendering of what the creator God represented. It's just not what he was doing. Um, now, we get a lot of um, um, folks thinking that he was, or there's this implicit um, discussions about Marcion's anti-Judaism, but I think that, again, comes down to more modern uh, worries and anxieties than anything uh, Marcion may have been going on about. So, mm. yeah. So yeah. uh, Marcion uh, made a distinction, as, as a lot of the Gnostic groups did, between the alien god and the demiurge. And, and you mentioned uh, he didn't describe the demiurge in the same kind of way as other Gnostic groups. He wasn't mm -hmm. an evil, uh, malevolent narcissist uh, like the Sethian yeah. demiurge. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> you say he was just. Is this more of like a kind of a... Um, kind of a keep the peace kind of lawgiver figure or was he did he have more of a uh, um, directive role in in the world well I think um, from what I can at least gather from what people thought about Marcion was that he seemed to assume the literalness of the Hebrew narrative uh, that there was Sodom and Gomorrah there there was the the Egyptian exodus so God clearly cared or the the creator cared for his people uh, but he also um, would uh, screw things up. He would, you know, I can't find you, Adam. Where did you go? Or in, like in Genesis, or uh, I believe it's in, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, of course, uh, Isaiah, where he tells them when they take the city, make sure you kill every man, woman, and child, mm -hmm. uh, pick up the infants and dash their heads against the wall. Um, that is the action of a typical deity, ruler, god of the time, but not the alien god of love. That seems to have been what was promoted by uh, Marcion, Paul, and presumably uh, their construction uh, of Jesus. So, no, he wasn't, um, uh, the creator wouldn't be um, uh, that sort of, uh, you know, like in the Sethian version, that sort of celestial abortion that he gets sort of rendered as. He was uh, a legitimate deity, just not the right deity or not his deity. Um, so, yeah, I, I think he, he certainly would, uh, uh, a Marcionite would probably have found something like Valentinus or, um, you know, any of those overly speculative 
creation accounts to be really problematic uh, to the point where you're just, why are you trying to find all this extra stuff when you don't need to? Mm. Um, so yeah, they, I mean, while he was a demiurge in the sense, he, uh, um, it was rightly earned uh, as opposed to say uh, Yatabalath or, or, or something like that. So. Right. So like, so Marcion's demiurge is, he's not necessarily a bad guy or a villain. He's, he's tough, but fair. You know, he, gives, he gives a bunch of rules. If you follow them, everything's fine. Yeah, well, he sometimes changes his mind. Um, okay. <laughs> so he's, you know, but he's a, he's um, in a very ancient way, he's a tyrant. Um, and I don't mean that like, uh, like, uh, like King Joffrey or something like that. Uh, I'm thinking more the, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the stern ruler who, if you cross them, that's the end. Uh, sort of the, you know, he's capable of compassion, but that is not his defining feature. His defining feature would have been justice. Or, or or proper behavior, adhering to the law, where that was not the the invisible father or the alien god that that Marcion would have uh, promoted. So that that does tend to give people the impression, I think, or they want to find the anti-Judaism there in some way. He was critical of the god, therefore he must have been uh, anti-Jewish in some way, shape, or form. Keeping with this with this uh, relationship of Marcion to to Judaisms and Judaism, what's what's the concept of nostalgic Israel, and and what is that concept, and what does it have to do with Marcion? Oh yeah, um, well, okay. For me, the idea of nostalgic Israel, I was tired of always saying Judaisms with quote marks and all that kind of stuff. You know, this is a pro or anti-Jewish, uh, or it's a, a Christian Sethian anti-Jewish philosophical whatever you know with with that kind of classification so i wanted to try to think of a better way of thinking about it so i just i came up with the idea of of uh nostalgic israel sort of these various groups constructing their own uh, rhetorical history of how the ancient hebrews should have been and what was important so somebody like um the apocryphon of john uh or the secret revelation would have had a very different version of of what that meant uh they're they're appropriating these myths they're appropriating these stories because they're important uh but they're they they need to spin them in such a way so um sort of to avoid talking about or at least the problems of having judaism christianity gnosticism i thought this is a better term uh, at least for me to work with when i when i went through that so um, when I think about Marcion and, and how he fits in, I, it allowed me to think about him without having to go through whether he was anti-Jewish or not. Uh, a lot of the scholarship wants to either put him as pro, or no, some wants him as a pro-Jewish preserver, some want to dismiss him as an anti-Jewish uh, hack, or some want to put him as a heretic. And I thought, well, Let's just kind of get rid of all those terms and try to talk about it, him or what he represents in, in, in a way that makes it easier to compare him with folks of his time. And, and that's sort of where I came up uh, with that. We'll see if, uh, if I, when I send my dissertation off for publication, anybody else buys it. <laughs> <laughs> my supervisor bought it, so I don't know if that counts or not. But uh, <laughs> That's step one, right? <laughs> that's step one, yeah. That's the big step, yeah. <laughs> So what uh, what role does Gnosis play in uh, Marcion's system of thought? Uh, well, I guess it sort of depends on how um, Gnosis would be defined. Uh, we're a lot we're of constantly trying to do that here. It's, I, uh, yeah. I, I, oh, exactly, yeah. Like this idea of sort of a secret um, or sort of special knowledge. Um, I don't think he would fit into that. It struck me as Marcion or Marcionism is very much about what you see is what you get. I mean, the Hebrew God said, bash their heads against the wall. That's got to be a, not, a, not a loving God. This other God must be it. And, and it seems very straightforward. There, there isn't a lot of uh, that sort of speculative uh, um, finesse that you tend to find in sort of Gnosis or that idea of Gnosis. Um, I always found Marcion never fit quite nicely with that category of Gnosticism. He seems to be the outlier, uh, at least to me. Um, he seemed much more... Uh, I, I, he strikes me as he would have been equally as appalled at, say, Tertullian as, again, a Valentinus. 
Uh, they're they're both equally wrong in his <laughs> mind, uh, just for very different reasons. If anything, he would have probably agreed more with, uh, you know, those sort of uh, second century proto rabbis. You know, that said Jesus had nothing to do with us, and he'd be like, "Yeah, you're right. He doesn't." Mm -hmm. And that would have been the end of it, right? Like that, he would have. Uh, so that secret stuff, no, I I don't think. Uh, uh, that would be what he would, uh, um, or his group, I should say, would have uh, really been all that interested in. Is this all of his, uh, the, in your opinion, is, is this a system that he, he sort of came up with, uh, or is he uh, like the system of two gods, or is he being influenced or in dialogue with the Cephians or the Platonists or the Valentinians or the, sure. the quote-unquote two powers in heaven Judaisms? Is he, is he seeing other people talking about two gods and being like, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. Well, there, there must be two gods then when I read sure. the Old Testament. I actually I think so. Um, I, unlike a lot of folks who have a, um, a hankering for Marcion, I don't see him as sort of the uh, catalyst for every innovation uh, over the last uh, first two centuries or second and third centuries of the Common Era. Uh, I mean, we did have the Platonists. You know, you had these ideas of demiurges floating around. You had the two powers in heaven people. Uh, the Sethians... Uh, I, I hesitate with that because I actually don't think there's anything. There is no Sethians. That's my next project. Uh, I just apparently disagree with everybody. That seems to be my job. But um, but I, I do think he was taking that um, uh, that sort of intellectual uh, atmosphere that would have been going on. It would not have been uncommon to have a creator deity and then a higher deity sitting above, uh, and then you know working it out from there. I mean, he would have saw that he would have been indebted to the Greco-Roman intellectual tradition. The Hebrew Bible is accurate. I, I can, you know, from his perspective, putting it together would make a lot of sense, would be very logical, I think, for him. But uh, as an inventor, no, uh, I don't think he uh, uh, would have, uh, or at least he, he doesn't seem to have represented that. Nothing he seems to have put forward strikes me as all that novel from his time frame. Right. Do you think, uh, we'll talk about influences, do you think it goes the other way? I, I won't call them the Cephians, but do you think that he was an influence <laughs> on, uh, on any of the groups that, that, we, that we sometimes call Gnostics, the groups who wrote the Nag Hammadi? Do you think any of them were reading Marcion or knew Marcion or encountered Marcionite communities and were like, okay, that's a cool idea, I'm going to incorporate some of that into, into my text sure. that ended up in, in the Nag Hammadi collection? Sure. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, sort of he influenced them much the same way he would influence somebody like uh, Tertullian or Irenaeus or Justin Martyr uh, as sort of a negative influence. Um, uh, he strikes me as sort of leaving a pretty large intellectual uh, footprint in sort of Christian theological thinking of the time. So, um, I mean, whether he was a direct influence or not, I'm not sure, uh, but he certainly would have been known uh, by these folks, or at least his movement would have been known. Uh, it, it appears that the Marcionism, whatever whatever brand of Christianity, uh, was quite quite successful. So um, somebody like a Valentinus or um, the Sethians, lack of a better word, would have certainly have heard of them and their ideas. Now, they may have taken something from them. He, his group may have taken something from them. Uh, it does seem that later uh, followers of Marcion changed his ideas. They, they, they seem to have added a third god in there somewhere, too, uh, these later configurations. So, um, yeah, he certainly influenced them, but to how, I think, that that's really hard to define, simply because you know what he did and thought is is um, not really not really accessible, unfortunately. Yeah, where sorry, where does the third god come into it in this later development? Or do oh, we know? That, yeah, there's. Oh, I'm gonna of course because I brought it up now. I can't remember. <laughs> um, I believe it was probably like a second or third generation Marcionites were starting to reconfigure these things. I, I'm drawing a blank on the on the name. It's later heresiological accounts want to talk about this third god that these Marcians apparently had. And that's where it seems to come from. So whether that's what was going on or the heresiologists were, were you know, adding more uh, insults 
to the uh, uh, Marcionite uh, um, uh, roast, uh, perhaps uh, that might have been it as well. But um, again, uh, you get the impression that um, from the heresiologist that, that Marcion would have been quite okay with people reworking the material, trying to make it better. Uh, that it wasn't necessarily locked in stone to the sense that you couldn't change a word here and there. He seemed to have been uh, quite okay with with refining it. At least that seems to be the consensus among among academics. So, are there any other points that might be considered similar to um, other uh, of the so the so-called Gnostic groups of of that time period? Oh. Uh, from from a Marcionite mm -hmm. perspective, or oh yeah, uh, well the the demiurgical stuff yeah. certainly uh, that that seems to be the biggest um, kind of link between the various Gnosticisms or, or what have you. Uh, the sort of Docetic Jesus, I think, certainly seems to have been common. Um, yeah, let's talk about that. We we like to call that the Jesus never pooped theory. Yeah, yeah, he. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I weirdly like to talk about that as well. So, uh, <laughs> so it, for, it, for our uh, viewers and listeners who aren't familiar with that term, can you give a brief overview? What, pooping? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah we're not gonna, let's, let's edit that out. Um, so the docetic Christ or the idea of a docetic Jesus is this notion that um, while Jesus may have appeared to have walked among the world, interactive with people uh, he really wasn't there there was no physical stuff uh, it was all the illusion of, of, a, of an entity so when Jesus was crucified in whichever account uh, he didn't really suffer it was the illusion of suffering uh, because coming from a spiritual realm he wouldn't uh, be able to interact with the material realm that that would have been seen as a, um, a mixing of types that would have been a problem so a lot of Christian groups seem to want to play with that idea, like where do we frame Jesus? Is he, did he eat or poop, as as the as the case may be, and what would that have been like? And and you do come across that uh, in some writing. So um, again, from from a Marcionite perspective, because we have no firsthand evidence or firsthand um, source of of what Marcionite wrote or thought, we can kind of. We're, we're stuck relying upon what the sources that we do have says. And, and it does seem to imply that he was uh, constructing a very docetic figure. Now, whether that was because that's what he did or that's what the heresiologists wanted to claim to make their case that Jesus wasn't docetic is a little up for debate. So yeah. Um, yeah. My, my gut tells me, yeah, that would make sense. If Jesus comes from... The spiritual realm of the, or the 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 realm of the old loving God, then then yeah, he seems to have just appeared out of the blue, and started preaching as a fully developed adult. What so, do you think the the theological impulse is that that would um, promote the theory of the docetic Jesus? You know, is it is it um, yeah. the the way I sometimes think of it is. You know, people thinking about Jesus and how great he is, well, then he must not be as, as terrible as we are. He must not have a, a, a terrible, ailing, you know, uh, yeah. terrible body like we have. So he probably didn't have one at all, you know. That, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I find that funny. I mean, I, I mean, I, they, those folks clearly have never read the infancy Gospels or where <laughs> Jesus goes around murdering people in a little hissy fit as an eight-year-old. Um, which are awesome if you've never read them. But, um, yeah, I, I kind of want to say it's that whole ancient distinction between spirit and matter. Uh, spirit was here, matter was here, and the, and the two should not meet. And I think there was a lot of self-conscious intellectual work trying to have that make sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you have a God that is fully human and fully divine? Right. Like, how, how does that work out in the wash? Right. Like if God, you know, it, it sort of reminds me a little bit uh, of, um, you know, contemporary Mormonism. If we are really the sons of God, does God have a penis? You know, and who is our mother like that? Like people would start thinking this stuff through and the implications. So I do think at least for the, the sources that I, I, I've encountered, it, it, a lot of it's more the intellectual puzzling through what's going on, whether they were, you know, had a gut feeling or, or wanted it to make more sense. 
religiously I, I i don't know i mean i'm i'm usually just dealing with the uh, intellectual uh, product <laughs> right uh yeah. rightly or, or fortunately or not as the case may be so uh yeah yeah um I, I i don't know i mean there is something kind of appealing about the um uh, i guess the human uh side of a of a jesus um you know i mean, as somebody who is not religious in any way shape or form i do remember thinking that though when i was a child uh, and, and sort of like, wow, that must have hurt getting nailed up there. And, you know, it's like things like right. that. So I, I, I do get it. I do get it. And, and that's why movies like The Passion of the Christ or The Last Temptation of Christ, I think, have that that oomph to them. There's something about that humanness of Jesus uh, or lack thereof that is really intriguing. So, Yeah. And we're kind of staying on that topic, but just to, just to go back a little bit in, in the sum up, or I'm going to try to really simplify and, and sum up about this, this alien god. So this, this mm-hmm. alien god, unlike, say, some of the, the... I'm just going to keep using the word Gnostic, Gnosticism. Yeah, I'm unlike some, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean. Yeah, but I unlike right some of the Gnostic texts in, in NHL, there, there, is, there is actually a kind of a, a connection between us and this world and the higher worlds. Right, mm-hmm. like, like this is sort of a poor copy of the Pleroma. Uh, some humans have a, a spark of the divine in them in the Sepian right. system, uh, but in in Marcion system, we, there's not quite that connection. Like Jesus no. is that connection. Like we have we have this earth that that we live on that was made by the demiurge, and then a completely outside of this universe, completely alien. God decides, finds us, notices us one day, and is like, their God's a little bit mean, so beams down Jesus to spread love? Yeah, in a lot of ways, that that's not a bad way of looking at it. Um, uh, the idea, is, uh, like, uh, say, in Sethianism, where you have, um, you know, our divine spark goes back to the Invisible Father, because that's where it comes from, that does not seem to have been the case with Marcionism. Uh, the, I believe it's Tertullian says that, well, your God is clearly a thief because he has no part in these people, so he's stealing them, mm. you know? So, I mean, the, the divine uh, in, the alien God only intervenes not because we are part of him or are, we have some connection or he had some sort of guilty conscience towards us, because he loves, that's his thing. Right. You know, he the, the alien God abducts people. <laughs> yeah, essentially. Yeah, yeah, but it's a it's a happy abduction. It's a happy. It's a, yeah, it's not a creepy abduc- abduction. So uh, um, yeah, he that that's sort of the idea that, uh, and it's something I think the Marcionites uh, seem to have struggled with. How do you account for your God being uh, a thief in a way? You know, like why why is he? Um, interfering in the first place when he had nothing to do with it. Well, again, the idea is because he loves. That's that's his primary motivation. So it's a very uh, almost beyond idealized version of a deity, um, you know, where he sends Jesus down to teach us about this God. And that and that's kind of Jesus's role, really, mm-hmm. is to point out that this n- new alien deity loves you regardless of who you are. Mm-hmm. You know, where the, the Hebrew God, and, and again, Hebrew, not the Hebrew God, but the God of the Hebrew Bible, will seems to be a bit temperamental in his love, right? Like, if you do this, or you do that, or maybe if you don't, you know, he could he could turn his back on you. Um, just ask Lot, mm-hmm. but, uh, or, uh, it's not Lot, uh, Job, sorry. But uh, uh, this idea that this God is unconditional love, I think, is what was the appealing part, and, and what... Uh, um, made him unique from, uh, say, again, the Apocrypha of John, where the Demiurge is this mistake, and uh, you almost get the impression the Invisible Father kind of gets guilted into fixing the mistake that's <laughs> made or something, right? So uh, it, it's always it has, cleaning up everybody else's mess. Uh, just so sitting there navel gazing, talking with emanations, and then some Yahoo has to go out and make a universe, you know, like. Uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, there does seem to be a, a very different character uh, in that, and then again, I, I think that was part of Marcion's or the Marcionite resistance to that overt speculation that they wanted to avoid, you know, talking about the different layers of heaven, and you know, when the Hebrew Bible said that it moved over the waters, that actually meant you know, twenty six chapters of the Apocrypha of John, where yeah. for them, it's like, yeah, it just was water, and they moved, you know, so. <laughs> What uh, what 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 is uh, Marcion's Gospel of the Lord? Is it Evangelum? Am I saying that right? What is yeah. what is his his gospel? 
Well, that, that's a good question. Um, again, we don't have a text. Uh, there is no uh, uh, extent text uh, of this uh, uh, of this uh, um, thing that he apparently wrote. Uh, either he wrote it or he edited it. Uh, that is sort of a big debate that's going on. Uh, now, the the, stra- the standard uh, narrative is that Marcion uh, took the Gospel of Luke and uh, basically took a hat was a hack hacked it apart, took out all the Jewish stuff he could find uh, to purge it of whatever. Um, and then he had this this sort of version. Um, it does appear to be very similar in scope and shape to Luke 3 uh, to 23, I believe. Um, but then again, it has a lot of Mark in there, it has some Matthew, it has a lot of Q, it has a bunch of stuff. So uh, whether uh, he hacked Luke, I don't think... Uh, I think that's uh, a question we discussed before. I, he, I, I certainly don't think he he hacked Luke at all. Uh, I don't yeah. think he would have. Uh, he knew Luke. I think Luke is too old for that. So, um, but yeah, it does seem to be roughly Luke uh, three to to twenty three, where you know the the first verse we are told is in you know on the uh, on the day in the city of uh, uh, um, I can't remember on the city Jesus appeared and began preaching in the synagogue, and that's how it starts. You know, so it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a smallish, uh, version of Luke for sure. Right. And we don't have it, but, uh, you're referring to it because we have quotes from it, right? From basically his enemies. Yeah. There, you have a lot of quotes from a variety of sources and, um, there's no sort of rhyme or reason why they would preserve what they preserve. Uh, the best, the best sort of preservation is Tertullian, uh, but at various times he misquotes things. You say, oh yeah, he took this from Luke. Well, actually that was from Matthew. You know, like, so again, th- there there does seem to be some problem, and and he just sort of, you know, overdoes something or changes something, or or he he's not trying to give us a a fair reading of what Marcion would have thought, of course, but he certainly wants to make the point that Marcion was wrong. <laughs> yeah, uh, and and we have other sort of correlations. Um, um, Ida von Harnack was the first to really try to bring up. Uh, a text, and and it's still probably the most widely uh, referenced one. There's been a few as of late. Uh, Jason Badoon's uh, text is one I actually prefer um, of the newer ones. But um, yeah, Harnax. Uh, but he would say, well, this would have been in Marcion because this is what he believed because he was anti-Jewish, and this is you know. So he would imply a whole bunch of stuff that for no apparent reason was there. So um, the the sort of the 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 shape of Marcion's text. Mm, it's it's kind of fuzzy to say the least. So the uh, there, there's sort of two there's a there's the dominant thought and, and of course there's other options besides these two. But but to clarify, the dominant thought is uh, uh, Marcion took took Luke and, and hacked it apart, right? To right. to make his own his, his own his own book. Uh, and then there's there's some more radical scholars that say actually what we know as Luke is Marcion's gospel. And what happened is, is, is the proto orthodox actually did the hacking. They hacked more sure. material into it, um, and I'm sure there's other ways. Uh, and the, there's more, probably more than two options and more than two theories. But, but which of those two theories do you ascribe to? Just or what's your gut feeling? Of course, we'll never know for sure. But do you of think course. do you think the text existed before, before Marcy? Or did he grab, actually, I can already think of a third option. Did he grab a proto-Luke, and then did the Orthodox take his text and turn it into Luke? And what, what's, I, what's your construction? I, uh, yeah, uh, I do think Marcion came first. Uh, it makes the most sense to me. I do. Um, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, there's a lot in sort of the, um, especially the, the first three chapters of Luke that just, seem, if not anti-Marcionite, then addressing certain concerns about uh, Jesus' genealogy, for instance, which Marcion just would have just seems to have dismissed. Luke seems to be throwing it in. And then if you combine it, too, with uh, Acts, mm-hmm. um, I always, I remember when I was starting this stuff, and I'd read Acts, and i go, well, this person clearly knows Paul, but why does he keep misquoting him or misrepresenting? Yeah. And it strikes me as a very dom- a way to domesticate Paul, uh, to yeah. cut, to get his pull his teeth out the, from its Marcionite bite, in a way. So I, I, get, I, I do honestly think uh, what we have as canonical Luke is post-Marcion. Uh, now, what Marcion would have got onto, 
Um, it, you know, you go through the, it depends on where you want to draw your sources from. I mean, um, some folks want a very small Marcion uh, text, some want a quite a large one. So depending on how big or small you want the gospel to be, then, then what came before it? I, my, my gut tells me there is something like um, an expanded, I don't know, Q or something like that. Um, not Luke, though. I don't think he took Luke or a proto-Luke. And I think he edited it, he changed it, he made it what he needed it to be. And then Luke would have added on top of that as a way of countering uh, a lot of the Marcionite claims. Because it does seem that he was addressing some of that. There's a line in in Acts, I believe, where Paul is going to Pontus, and then Jesus shows up in the boat and says, don't go there, don't ever go there. And he's like, okay, and then it doesn't go. <laughs> uh, what strikes me is a very... Uh, very anti-Marcionite uh, uh, attack. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, I do think Marcion came, something came before Marcion, Marcion took over it, and then Luke took over that. Right, and, we, and when we try to recreate this, we can see, like you talked about, it seemed that Marcion and his community was a really big deal at the time. So if you're trying yeah. to show that, that my, we are right to put or the other churches are right, and you're wrong, you want to bring them in the fold, like right. rewriting the book is a great way to do it, right? It's like, Bobby wow, Marcion kind of gave you the wrong version, but you're already a little bit familiar with the book that has people in it, like an act, like Paul, that you already yeah. know and you like. So, so like I, I can understand the reconstruction and the reason why you know uh, uh, somebody would would, would uh, a community or somebody or a scribe would create Luke right to to yeah, bring it really it's to bring people together in a way. Yeah, most certainly. I mean, especially um, it does seem, and I'm, and I'm going by uh, uh, John Knox, uh, Joseph Tyson, more recently, uh, who has made the argument that it really is uh, um, uh, Luke is a reaction to Marcion. Uh, so, of course, um, uh, you know, that, that sort of agenda doesn't make sense, especially in light of how uh, Paul seems to have, if not completely disappeared, faded away until Marcion got him and used him to, to a lot of success. Uh, yeah. So they had to deal with that. How do you deal with this um, agenda? Uh, or this this successful evangelical movement when um, you know we could either debunk Paul or we could domesticate him and and I think Luke Acts is, is in a large part that um, so it's it's even not even just anti Marcionite but sort of uh, or I don't want to say anti Marcionite but against Marcion it's against Marcion's use of Paul in his theories uh, that that's sort of my sense when I when I when I read Luke Acts and with from those. Uh, from that light, it, it certainly does make a lot more sense to me anyway. Uh, and I think it's becoming more of a common scholarly uh, point of view. Um, I think a lot of people are starting to come around to that a little more, um, especially in North America uh, versus, uh, say, other parts of the world where, where it was such an outlier. I think it's becoming more common uh, to think about that. You have folks like the Burton Max and these more populist writers who are, not that Burton Max is a populist, but... Um, uh, more read people, uh, or more uh, authors that are read more outside of the field, are promoting it, and people are starting to at least take it seriously, which uh, that's good. Uh, I do, even though I do like the idea of Marcion being, uh, I think it was Irenaeus who called him the mouse who gnaws on scripture. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love that. I, uh, I, I, I took that as when I got my doctorate, I took that as a tattoo, so um, just to prove my point, I guess. So. <laughs> So, uh, Glenn, I, I was taught, uh, I, I love bringing this up in the show, even though it was 15 years ago, but I went to college and I'm right smart. And uh, <laughs> yes. I did, I took some, yes, some MRT. classes. MRT, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> MRT. So I, uh, I was taught in school that, that Marcion had a big influence on the compilation of the New Testament because of his, sure. because, because of his text and him saying that some books were wrong and his was right, that, that, uh, that gave the impetus to, to, to what, what we know as normative Christianity or proto-Orthodox to make, to make the Bible that we have now. So is, right, is that yeah. true? Was, was he an influence on the compilation of the New Testament? I think he had a big influence. Um, it seems that he came up with the first canon. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the first one to come up with this definitive list of what constitutes Christian scriptures. Um, I do think the idea of putting Paul 
probably we can ascribe to Marcion. Uh, as I said before, Paul seems to have been a bit of a a uh, bit of a, um, a failure up until that point, if I may uh, say the term. Uh, Marcion seemed to have revived him and uh, breathed new life into the, the Paulinism uh, and ran with it. Now, whether everybody decided that they need to have a, a four Gospels versus one because of Marcion, um, I believe it was um, Marcus uh, Vincent, Vincent, I can't remember his name. Uh, he seems to want to describe everything to Marcion, and, and I, I don't, I, I'm not convinced that's the case. Um, Marcion was a big influence, and I think he pushed a lot of people, or at least a lot of the Orthodox, to uh, start to define their things a little more. Um, you know, what is our relationship to Judaism? What, what should we put in a canon? But whether it was a direct, you know, Marcion did this, therefore we must do this. I, I'm a little less sure of that, but I don't think we can undersell that he was important. Um, he certainly wasn't just a footnote, um, but I do think um, as sort of the, it seems a little trendy at the moment, if there's such a thing as trendy in <laughs> academia. Um, Marcion seems a bit sexy all of a sudden, so uh, putting a lot on his plate I think might be a bit of an overstretch, but it's, at least he's getting some recognition. Um, yeah. When I started studying this stuff, I'd never heard of him, mm. so um, for me, that it's kind of nice uh, to see that. But yeah, as um uh, as the only catalyst, no. But as a catalyst, I think yes. I, I think we can we could say that with uh, some sort of. Well, we, I don't think we'd have Luke Acts, for instance. Yeah. Without Nelson, so that that does that, lead that does quite lead nicely into our, our our next question. You know, why why is Marcy important today? And um, a few a minor. You well, you said that he is he is sexy at the moment. He's he's a bit of a trend. But there's a few legit scholars who are who are kind of radical. You already mentioned Marcus Vincent, uh, Paul Price, to a lesser right. extent Jason Badoon. They they basically view Marcion as the most important figure in early Christianity besides mm -hmm. Jesus. Do you like? Do you think he's that big of a deal? So that that's one question. And the second part is why do you find him so fascinating, and, and why why do you want sure. people to know about him? Sure. Yeah. Um, huh, that's a good question. Is he as important as Jesus? I, again, uh, Jesus and Marcion for me kind of represent sort of opposites of the uh, of the sort of rhetorical spectrum. I mean, Jesus is this uh, mythic figure, and I say mythic not so much as uh, like a dismissive of a figure, but something like uh, Bruce Lincoln would say this this figure that it represents something incredibly important uh, of what is good about Christianity. Where I think, especially recently, Marcion is sort of functioning in the opposite. He is the, the, the bad dude of Christianity uh, and what went wrong. So uh, in a lot of ways, I think he is uh, incredibly important in how we think about these things. Um, uh, whether he is as important as Jesus, uh, probably not. I mean, even even though I'd like to say that, part of me is screaming in the back of my head, like, go ahead, say it, say it. But <laughs> Um, I won't. The uh, the idea that uh, he, um, he was, I think, certainly more important than he gets a lot of credit for. Um, uh, again, I, I refer to the uh, heresiologists that would say, oh, yeah, he's nothing. He's this Pontic mouse who gnaws on scriptures. He doesn't mean anything. Yeah, Tertullian writes a five-book uh, uh, treatise on how to refute him. It's like, yeah, he thinks Madame protests too much. Uh, a little bit, so I do think he he figured large in the in the rhetorical nightmares of these people. Um, so, but whether he was, I, I don't think he was as important as, say, Paul, for instance. I, I kind of think Paul, even though he sort of disappeared and came back, he his sort of version of Christianity has been the most um, influential. Perhaps so. Whether or not, uh, uh, I think um, no, he's not as important as Jesus, but he certainly uh, deserves more recognition than than what uh, he certainly has been given, at least historically and, and scholarly. There's lots of scholarly work that that dismisses him out of hand, and I think that's I, I, that sits kind of sour with me for some reason. There's something uh, uh, that we need to explore uh, when it comes to him. He makes it more interesting. I find Christianity quite uh, dull without figures like Marcion and Valentinus floating in the background. Um, you know, otherwise I'm just doing Sunday school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So, uh, why I find him personally interesting? Well, I mean, I hadn't really heard of him until uh, probably my first year of my PhD. Uh, I I dis- I had a friend who referred to him, and I this person who seemed to figure so large in the rhetorical nightmares of these people, yet none of his texts survive. Yet he seems so scary to them. Uh, this struck me as really fascinating uh, that this this boogeyman existed out there, and uh, scholars were not taking it all that seriously or just dismissing him as a heretic or a hack or or something and i that just seems so unsatisfying and and i have to admit i have a little sympathy for for his position i mean uh i'd read uh you know justin martyr say oh yes when you know the hebrew bible says a sacrificial lamb that actually means jesus and if when it says this it actually means this and i'm like really that doesn't seem to mean that at all. But then Marcin's like, nope, they're different. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. <laughs> you know, like, like there, there's a certain kind of logic to it that I found very appealing, uh, personally. You know, but uh, I'm not a, a devout in any way. But uh, um, yeah, I'd like to see. Um, um, I, I'd like to see his sort of. Uh, influence sort of reclaim for academics i think uh uh you know we need to recognize uh, him valentinus uh some of these other folks place uh when we just talk about early christianities it's not just the the folks who who won or the folks who uh texts we have we have to remember the other people too otherwise you know we're just doing theology all over again <laughs> not that that's a bad thing i don't mean to imply that that's a terrible thing but <laughs> You know, let, let's let's finesse it. Let's look at the uh, the variety for sure. So, yeah, theology for the theologians. <laughs> well, not not even that. I mean, it's funny. We we do. Uh, you know, I have a lot of friends. I, I have done a lot of theology or, or talked about folks who do theology, and it's it's incredibly intellectually vigorous and interesting. But it's not the same as sort of what I do, yeah. for instance. So uh, I think for somebody in my position, bringing him back in into the conversation also helps explain a lot of things. Um, why Marcion was, you know, there, when you put him in there, a lot of stuff starts to make more sense, like Acts, for instance, uh, or the um, the Nicene Creed, where they insist on God was both the creator and the father of Jesus. Mm-hmm. I mean, if everybody believed that, then why do you keep going on about it in the damn creed? So, um, there, you know, if it's not him, then somebody like him. Uh, you know, we need to include that to, to help understand what what was actually happening. So, I'm interested to see the uh, the Marcionite reconstructionists. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> so one of my uh, students said I should have a church, uh, base my own church on Marcy, and I'm like, well, that academic thing doesn't work out. Maybe we can we can get that going. We, we decide it's going to be riding our bikes and drinking a lot of coffee. That's going to be our Marcionite uh, Eucharist. So. Yeah, and cats. There's going to be cats everywhere too. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> It's a work in progress, yeah. <laughs> and important theological justifications for all of it. <laughs> I'm sure I could come up with something. <laughs> mm-hmm. So you um, you mentioned the Apocryphon of John in your dissertation in relation to Marcy, and can you uh, expand upon that a bit? Well, I, I, I didn't think of them necessarily as being uh, linked in any way. I was very interested, uh, well, my dissertation came out of an, ar- an article I read that said anything that was demiurgical must be anti-Jewish. Mm. And I said, well, that's dumb. <laughs> um, so I, I, I thought I started looking at these various uh, demiurgical texts. I encountered Marcion. Uh, and I found the Apocryphon of John and Marcion are sort of the two spectrums of demiurgical um, understanding. You know, we have this figure of Jesus. We have these, these negative deities or, or however you want to frame them. Um, I think both those, you know, you put Marcion and the writer of the Apocryphon of John into a into a room, they would have beat each other senseless. Uh, I don't <laughs> think they would have they would have liked each other at all. Uh, but it's funny how these very different, distinct, uh, almost uh, diametrically opposed discourses still are anti-Jewish in scholarship. And I thought there's there's something weird going on there. There's nothing. The only thing really common is is uh, the sort of demiurgical stuff, but that's really not the same. And this assumption by modern scholars, when there's no evidence uh, of this uh, being the case, so I kind of threw them together together as a way of of making this larger rhetorical point that perhaps uh, this classification system is is more than problematic. So mm. uh, that was sort of where I came at it from the uh, 
the Apocryphon of John. And I, I have to admit, I, I love the text of the Apocryphon of John. Um, as sort of an ancient text, it's easily my favorite. Um, I had to spend, well, what did we do? Two and a half years of Coptic, so I could maybe read a little bit of it. And uh, <laughs> it's, it wasn't worth it. But uh, the, uh, but the, I mean, the, the text itself is so fascinating, and it's such an important uh, element of the second century Christian history. Um, so yeah, uh, the links between them are very artificial, um, but therefore a greater uh, argument that I make later on, where you know scholars are are claiming a certain uh, status for these texts more about their own version of what should have been and could have been Christian or Jewish than than really what these groups were all about. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, we, that that often comes up actually when talking about Gnosticism in public. You know, there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of people who want to insert. Well, yeah, let's say insert a pretty hardcore anti-Semitism into mm-hmm. uh, discussions of Gnosticism, and and yeah, admittedly, the texts when read in a certain light can definitely. Uh, lend themselves to that kind of interpretation, but um, I always think the distinction is is a bit more subtle. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the I was reading um, uh, Karen King uh, released a book a few years ago, The uh, Secret Revelation of John. Oh yeah, uh, a fantastic new translation. Mm-hmm. Uh, great job. Except at one point, she makes this claim that well, the anti-Semitism in uh, or the anti-Jewishness in the Apocryphon of John is on, would have been recognized by the same stuff that's going on in the Gospel of John. And she lists all the stuff in the Gospel of John. I'm like, but that's not in the Apocryphon of John. You just assumed it's there yeah. or that it's anti-Jewish. And I'm like, that, that's a, a serious issue, I think. And, and, and again, in modern scholarship, if, uh, you know, now we are insisting on, you know, what used to be, you know, anti-Jewish rhetoric is now pro-Jewish, mm. you know, where where John used to be against the Jews, now it is part of a discourse amongst Judaisms. And that's correct. I, I actually think that is the better way of looking at it. But, you know, it, it strikes me as, you know, this sort of anti-Jewish flavor that you throw on Marcion or the Apocryphon of John is more about uh, inauthenticating their version of Christianity, um, making them the heretics all over again. Because mm-hmm. uh, we don't call them heretics anymore. Um, now we get to call them anti-Jewish as a sort of the, the re-quarantining of these <laughs> of these texts. So uh, that strikes me as what what is going on uh, with that. And uh, I think Hans Jonas was one of the first to uh, have his book around here somewhere. Uh, the Gnostic religion. He makes a couple of pretty strong claims that the the Gnostics were anti-Jewish, and and that has stuck around, unfortunately. Yeah. Yep, there's a lot of stuff from that time period that sticks around, and uh, it, you know, just yeah. because it's the first, like the first thing that people encountered about uh, sure. this stuff, you you know, it just tends to be what sticks. And uh, well, it was the first book I read, and yeah. uh, it's beautifully written. Like mm-hmm. you can't. I mean, he had none of the text; he just sort of went with it. And you're just like, damn, that's that's good. Yeah. Like, you, you, there, it's an enjoyable, engaging, convincing read, but. You gotta take it with a serious grain of salt. I mean, uh, much like uh, Elaine Pagel's uh, Gnostic Gospels, they weren't these uh, proto-feminists either. Right. Uh, um, again, there there does seem to be you know what is considered Gnostic gets to be the dumping ground of what people are concerned about. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I mean, you know, I think that is something we have to be really concerned about as well. So. Yeah, we that comes up a lot here also, and a lot of people's I, first I, encounter with Gnosticism these days is the Gnostic Gospels, and um, there are some um, some leaps that are made uh, in that sure, book yeah. that just aren't aren't quite justified. <laughs> no, uh, and I, I mean I've recommended it to numerous people as their yeah. first read uh, because oh, yeah. then I say okay after you read that. Maybe you should read What is Gnosticism by Karen King. Mm-hmm. And then here's this other thing I got for you here. And, you know, uh, it's a slow process for sure. Exactly. Um, but, uh, no, I mean, if, you, if that's going to be your first encounter, I, I can think of worse. Oh, yeah, than certainly. Elaine Pagels, for sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go pick up some Sylvia Brown and... Uh, uh, and yeah. Da Vinci Code, and uh, <laughs> you'll know everything uh, there is to know about Gnosticism. Right. 
I, I have I, I almost want to read the Da Vinci Code just because, uh, but I, I know I can't do it because I just get angry yeah. every time, yeah. right? It's like I'm sure like a physicist who watched Star Wars, <laughs> you know, like they just must get fear, infuriated with that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. Well, I I, I often uh, I, obviously the treatment of the Gnostics and the treatment of the history in the Da Vinci Code is is poor, but I wouldn't be here without it. Uh, no, <laughs> so no, I mean, it, I would, it was a jumping would, off point. I, I, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have got my uh, uh, a couple of scholarships, I'm sure, if people hadn't heard of the, the Gnostics <laughs> or Dan Simmons. So, uh, or Dan Simmons, sorry, uh, Dan Brown. Dan yeah. Simmons is a sci-fi writer. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's something there's something there, and and it makes my my degree vaguely appealing to outsiders. You know, people say, "Oh, you study religion," they all get bored. They go, "I study Gnosticism." They go, <laughs> "You know, it's like you're right, long hair and glasses too." Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so we were talking about Secret John, which, by the way, is, is a text we both love, and uh, Father Tony, in particular, has, has spent quite a bit of time with that text. Excellent. And, yeah, and yeah. we've actually gone through a number of shows. Uh, on it, but that does lead in. Sometimes it's called a Sepian text. So, Father, I think yes. that leads into to another question. Yeah, let's do taxonomy. Let's. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you mentioned earlier that uh, your next project was going to be about the um, uh, group of texts that we normally categorize as Sepian, but you seem to imply that that was uh, inappropriate as a categorization. What, what do we call these things, or are they? Um, do, do we talk about them individually as like Ophite or Barbalo Gnostics or yeah. Platonizing Judaism? What, what, how do we how do we discuss these things? Have a proto Gnostic Sethianizing Judaic wisdom speculation? Yeah, or something. I'm writing yeah. it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's good. Uh, no, I, I as sort of a um, an academic classification. I, I think it's it's perfectly fine. Um, there are certain similarities amongst these texts. And again, we do know when somebody says Sethian, we do know what that means. Um, yeah. My issue is the sort of invented um, schematic history of the Sethians. I was reading, um, I believe it's John Turner, who, who said, you know, well, there's no evidence for this, but, you know, here's how they would have split from Judaism and then um, went over to Christianity and split from them and then went over to the Neoplatonists and split from them. And he, he invents this amazing history that a lot of people do out of nothing. Uh, and I think that, you know, as a, as a descriptor of groups on the ground, I think that's a little problematic. Uh, you know, we are giving these guys, uh, these, these guys, these, these texts, uh, a community based upon modern classifications or mm. modern desires. And I find that really problematic. Um, it's sort of like assuming that the Dead Sea Scrolls must be um, a scene. You know, uh, there a lot of people, that, that's, that's sort of just the default that we invent this sort of narrative around how, or we try to shoehorn them into that category. And I find that kind of problematic uh, myself. I find that that, is, that sort of buttresses very normative ideas of, you know, Judaism. They left Judaism because they had demiurgical stuff. Well, is that not Jewish? Could that still, could that not be Judaism? Like, there does seem to be this essentialism built into it, um, which which I find somewhat problematic. So, um, yeah, as an academic sort of um, classification, I, I don't have a problem, but inventing historical footprint for these folks or a Sethian group yeah, I, that that strikes me as we're stretching it a little bit uh, there, and there, there's probably more interesting things that can be done with it. Uh, I find that kind of more about you know reaffirming uh, what constitutes Judaism or Christianity than about describing Sethianism, mm-hmm. um, which which again uh, seems to be the uh, uh, the gong I like to bang a lot. So. <laughs> well, I, I fall into this trap. Well, I don't know if I consider it a trap, but I certainly do this a lot. I have the, the luxury of nobody actually takes me very seriously. So I get to, <laughs> <Me too>. uh, <laughs> I get to, I get to get away with quite a bit here, but I, I do also speculate about well, specifically the gospel of John, as, as Jonathan mentioned, I, I, um, I've read it probably 200 times. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, worked, worked very, very hard with it. But um, you know, the the idea of a um, kind of a Platonized Jewish text 
that later became Christianized, um, and you know what what the community might have looked like and where they might have come from um, to have done that. At least the the final Christianizing version that we <coughs> have um, is. Uh, it's, it's very interesting speculation. You know, I, I sometimes refer to that text as the Gospel of John Part Two, not yeah, because yeah. of any specific, um, uh, you know, connective tissue necessarily between the two texts. Although certainly, you know, any um, any Christian uh, uh, text will have similarity. Any two Christian texts will have similarities. But because I can imagine a a, a community that traveled from a sure. uh, kind of Gnostic Judaism, quote unquote, through Christianity, and then into the community of John, and then splitting back out it's when they get there. kicked out. So that's how I like to think of it, anyway. But uh, <laughs> it, and there's something so satisfying about that. Yeah. Like I, I, I hear you, and I, and I'm like, yeah, that sounds great, right? Like th there is something uh, so appealing about that. My and again was as sort of a. Um, you know, just sort of talking about it, I, I would kind of go along with that. I, I would get it. But uh, from the, the evidence that at least I've been able to see and, and the arguments that folks who are proponents of the, the Sethian argument, it just doesn't hold water to me. Hmm. Uh, so I'm, something's either missing uh, or there's something unsatisfying, at least for me, about that, that sort of uh, reclassification. I, my suspicion is that Sethianism is just a new way of calling something Gnostic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we used to call them heresy or heretics. Now we, we don't. And then we used to call them Gnostic, but then somebody like Karen King and that started to deconstruct it. Folks still do. I mean, there's that whole Gnostic school coming out of Yale, I want to say, um, that want to kind of revive the term, but I, I don't think that's going to work. So then, okay, we can use Sethianism. That's a good term. You know, that, that'll it's work. It's specific yeah. enough that, yeah. But but still vague enough that it still it seems to still touch on all the on all the power chords of what used to be Gnostic, right? right. Except uh, it, it's a little more refined because we don't have Valentinus as Gnostic anymore. Yeah, we have Valentinianism, so we got to pull him out. And Marcion got you know promoted or degraded depending on who you talk to uh, a while ago. So we're kind of left with a few. Uh, our, our sources are still smaller. Yeah, uh, and and again, it's sort of a topological category. It does make sense, uh, and as it was invented by scholars, it, it really did work. It's just when that historic uh, narrative that a lot of folks like John Turner, uh, Nebraska, kind of took off with. Uh, I, I have not so much problems with the results, but w where this is coming from and what conceptual work that's doing there there seems to be that seems to be more about modern need than than describing ancient practice or or text or, or something there, there's something seems to be lacking there for mm -hmm. me so uh that's my my next <laughs> thing i'm gonna harp on right and, and to be clear a lot of judaisms had demiurgic positive demiurgic figures yeah. it would be like it'd be like metatron the the, the yeah. number one angel he god tells him go make a world for me or Sophia go make a world yeah, for me in a yeah. positive sense it wasn't a weird funky thing that you would have to break up over and go into the desert because <laughs> lots of yeah. Judaism had had a demiurge yeah yeah I mean uh, and that's very true um, uh, I think that sort of um, sort of negative deity would have been a real problem I mean oh, sure. deities were so nationalized in a way um, they were very emblematic of the of the of the people or, or what have you. So, um, you know, I, to me, it always struck me is that the folks who were um, one of the things that always gets me with Sethianism is people will say, well, they clearly didn't like Jews because they're making fun of them. <laughs> I'm like, I've read ancient texts. If you're going to make fun of somebody, you were a lot more direct about that. Uh, this strikes me as people that were utterly invested in Judaism or those stories, but the the rationalization didn't make sense. Yeah. Um, God, you know, maybe post temple. This seems this is sort of a, a an offhand, kind of almost a cliche, but you know, uh, God's gonna save us. Well, guess what? Jerusalem got the crap kicked out of it. Now what do we do? Oh well, maybe God wasn't the God we thought he was. He's still the God, right? But yeah. how do we how do we account for these kinds of things? And and so the intellectual work that this stuff does, and and see what I, when I look at them, I always think what what questions are being answered by this. Um, why would why would a scribe put so much effort into this beyond just, you know, being a, a 
you know, complaining about something, right? <laughs> there, there seems to be something important there. So, right. Uh, the, yeah, I, it's the nerd writing fan fiction. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I hope it's a little more than that, but I mean, <laughs> uh, my luck, that's probably what it is. But uh, um, it's good fanfic. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. It's, sure, it's, it sure is better than Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, and sometimes it's fanfic that's fixing a problem, right? Yeah. Like it's, uh, yeah. you know, in Star Wars: The Force Awakens. Like, like, <laughs> how did they just find the Millennium Falcon, right? Like, yeah. how does Han Solo like space is big? So when you're writing fan fiction, it's oh, he hit a uh, he hit a tracker in it years before, right? So yeah, in, in some ways, the writers of Secret John, they love Genesis. Like, they don't hate it. Oh, they yeah. love oh, yeah. that book. They're obsessed oh, God, with yeah. Genesis. But sometimes they're fixing some of the problems. They're writing in. They're like, well, no, you know, the, the, walking, the walking in the garden, you know, story, right? Well, that can't be right. They got that wrong. I'm going to fix it. Yeah. And they left yeah. out the part about midichlorians. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, don't bring it back. Uh, that's heresy. That's heresy. That's right there. Yeah. Uh, no, you're right. I mean, they, they clearly are invested uh, in this stuff. If if you are going to, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, it's like, oh, look how anti-Jewish they are. It's like, I just think they're a different flavor of Judaism. Mm -hmm. Nobody hates something that much where they'd spend that much intellectual labor making us fun of it in this subtle way if they wanted to say i don't like jews they would have just wrote i don't like jews right well, like, you know what i mean like like it would have been so so much easier to do it you know like i, I just it doesn't feel like that accounts for the the you know the use of plato and and wisdom speculation and and everything else that gets played into that stuff is is i mean it's a remarkable piece of uh of literature Right. Uh, and the Nakamati people, I mean, there was uh, three copies, I believe, mm -hmm. four copies uh, within the collection. So, I mean, clearly they thought it was important. Um, I mean, Irenaeus kind of quotes a, 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 a pre-Christian pre version of it. Uh, so, I mean, this idea of float was floating around for a long time. So, clearly it, it dug into people's brains. It, it was something more than just a, uh, a critique. I, I, it, it strikes me very much... Uh, um, something that that needs to be reincorporated into Christianity for sure. So, mm -hmm. well, let's talk about. Um, the, you mentioned that uh, there's a there's a swing in scholarship to call uh, to eliminate the term uh, Gnostic and to replace it with the term Sethian. Uh, where does that leave Valentinus and Carpocrates and Basilides and and sure, all yeah. these folks? Is is Gnosticism a bad category or is it just uh, in need of a little tweaking? I, I personally think it's a bad category. I think it does more to obscure than it does to describe. Um, you know, when, I, when you would say Gnostic 50 years ago, um, that would include Marcion, uh, Valentinus, Thunder Perfect Mind, a whole bunch of things. It basically just meant weird. <laughs> you know, it meant crazy there is like uh you know fodder for philip k dick novels that kind of thing um where this uh you know now we don't talk about valentinianism as gnostic we call it valentinianism mm -hmm. you know there's been a big push to kind of classify it on its own terms and, and once you pull it off that gnostic uh wastebasket all of a sudden then you can start talking about it in parody with other discourses like do a comparison of uh, johannan christianity and valentinian christianity uh, you don't have to go through the legwork of saying, well, this is heretic and this is orthodox and, and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. So I do think um, the term Gnostic, as it has been used, um, you know, by by a lot of folks, uh, even up to, um, um, oh, Alistair Logan, uh, they they use it as a way to show the otherness of, of this Christianity or this kind of Christianities as more of a way to buttress their own version of what must have been normative. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and I don't think that's that actually does service to the material. Um, so, you know, getting rid of the category, I think, allows us to, to avoid that. Um, and I do think it appears to me anyway that Sethianism is sort of the last gasp of Gnosticism, mm -hmm. that people are, are using it as a, as a historical, as a, as a group of... A, um, beyond just a typolo uh, typological category, but into describing historical movements, because you still need those heretics. You still <laughs> need those others of Christianity. Uh, otherwise, then, then why isn't Thomas in the, in the New Testament? You know, like mm -hmm. things like, 
stuff like that kind of comes in. I mean, and, and this is not just, you know, popular representation. I mean, academics do it as well. Mm. Um, nobody looks at the Gospel of Philip for historical Jesus stuff. You know, even even how uh, SBL wants you to cite canonical versus non-canonical materials is different. Mm -hmm. You know, you're partitioning them. And, you know, I'm there, I'm, if I'm talking about the second century texts, why am I using fourth century theological preference to determine how they're referenced? Mm -hmm. like, it does seem very odd to me. So um, I, I do think there's some latent othering still going on. Um, and, and it could be religious conviction. It could be just, you know, normative takes uh, on this stuff. I mean, I grew up in a pretty standard Christian-centric environment, both at home and at school. So it still does feel weird talking about, you know, the parable of the assassin and, and Thomas as being as good as the, you know, prodigal son. Like, mm -hmm. you, know, it's, I, I, you know, there is something, unfortunately, still normative about that. But, uh, yeah, I do think it's, I, I hope. I mean, in my own sense, I hope it does fade out uh, a little bit. And we can start talking about these things more in parity with each other as opposed to wading through these levels of, of uh, classification before we get to the good stuff. Yeah. Do you have a replacement category in mind, or do you lump any of these uh, traditions together in, in any meaningful way? I would almost talk about each text on its own, mm -hmm. uh, unless you can find uh, links between them, like uh, Johannine literature, for instance. I mean, clearly the letters and the gospel are related, so I can put those together. Uh, the authentic Pauline letters, I can put those together. Um, Valentinian stuff, that, that's a bit up for debate, but you know, the few things that do really appear Valentinian, I can easily clump them together and say, yes, they have a shared something. Um, and, and the problem with Sethianism is a lot of the, the things that make them apparently Sethian can also be found in non-Sethian material as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the classification seems uh, not as exact as I would hope it would be uh, for, for, for academic work. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where, you know, you know, from just talking to people, I can say, yeah, Sethian, and, and we get it, we, we understand. But if I want to sit down and write an article... I think I need to work through that a little more. I need to get past that sort of imp the implied parameters of what that meant to be Sethian, much like what it was to be Jewish. You know, could you be uh, a polytheist and be Jewish? You know, in an ancient world, or did you have to be circumcised? There seems to be evidence that there was Jews who were against that. Um, so does that mean they're not Jewish, or do we need to expand our boundaries of what was Judaism in antiquity? So I think Sethianism is is unfortunately pushing. Uh, constraining still. Uh, yeah. I don't know what I would do to replace it. I, I would call the Apocryphon of John the Apocryphon of John because it needs no introduction. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it sort of does everything on its own, I have to admit. It's uh, about as concise as you can get. So. Mm -hmm. so what's the next umbrella up? Is it just Christianity? Yeah, I think why not? Uh, or even... Uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a step of shameless self-promotion, let's just all call them nostalgic Israels. Mm -hmm. uh, and went from there, right? Where I don't have to talk about Judaism or Christianity in any way. I can just, let's, let's look at Marcion, um, Tertullian, and, uh, you know, the Apocryphon of John without having to wade through who sat in what camp. <laughs> and let's just try to compare them as how do they construct this mythology. Uh, and what's behind it. Maybe, maybe that would be, that, that's what I would like to do myself. Um, uh, you know, as a way to kind of get more to the meat, because a lot of times when you read these comparisons, they get hung up on the relative Jewishness or Christianityness <laughs> of something, and and then by the time you get to the end, it's it's over. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's all it's all um, it's, it's all, all self-referential and circular. Yeah, yeah, and it feels very unsatisfying to me. Like if I like, you know, I always was told that Marcin was clearly anti-Jewish, for instance. Mm -hmm. Like, well, when you look at what he apparently said and, and sort of what the, the, you know, sort of like a cliche straw man rabbi would say, they kind of seem to be on the same page. They're, you know, the, yeah, the God is going to send the Messiah. Yeah, you're right. Jesus has nothing to do with that. Yeah, you're right. Huh, let's go for beer. You know, mm -hmm. like it does, it, it, it does not, it feels like there's something else going on. So, um, you know, or at least if we're going to not use the same categories, be aware that they are the, the map and not the territory, yeah. I think, as, to steal from Jay-Z Smith. If you're going to steal from anybody, that's the guy to steal from. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that, that would be what I would try. That's what I'm trying to do anyway. 
All right. Well, that's a great place to end it, and uh, we're about out of time here. So thank you once again, uh, Dr. Oh, Farron, for joining us. Um, that, that was an awfully fun conversation. <laughs> it was very fun. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. All right. And uh, we'll talk to us again when you, uh, when you do your next uh, project on Seth. For sure. <laughs> for sure, I will. Okay. On Nostalgic Thanks Israel. <laughs> Bestseller coming to a bookstore near you. All yeah. right. We knew him when. Yeah. All right. Well, then, for all of you who are watching and listening along at home, we'll see you next week. Thank you. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.